Okay. I've got the yellow book. A very long time ago I remember doing this, so if you remember it really well, I'm sorry, but I just love what I'm going to share with you. I just think it's brilliant. The following is a series of quotes taken from insurance or accident forms. They are the actual words of people who tried to summarise their encounters with trouble. Coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree I don't have. <laughs> the other car collided with mine without giving any warning of its intentions. I thought my window was down, but I found it was up when I put my hand through it. I collided with a stationary vehicle coming the other way. A van backed through my windscreen into my wife's face. A pedestrian hit me and went under my car. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. <laughs> I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. <laughs> In my attempt to kill a fly, I drove into a telephone pole. <laughs> <laughs> I've been driving for 40 years and then I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident <laughs> oh dear I was on the way to the doctors with rear end trouble when my universal joint gave way causing me to have an accident <laughs> To avoid hitting the bumper of the car in front, I struck the pedestrian. <laughs> As I approached the intersection, a stop sign suddenly appeared in a place where no stop sign had ever appeared before. I was unable to stop in time, and so I had an accident. <laughs> My car was legally parked as it backed into the other vehicle. An invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my vehicle and then vanished. <laughs> oh dear. I told the police that I was not injured, but removing my hat, I found I had a skull fracture. <laughs> The pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran him over. <laughs> I was thrown from my car as it left the road. I was later found in the ditch by some stray cows. <laughs> oh, the telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path when it struck my rear end. <laughs> Oh dear. I was unable to stop in time and my car crashed into the other vehicle. The driver and passenger then left immediately for holiday with injuries. <laughs> Brilliant. <clears throat> well, I trust that's made you chuckle. Um, I... This morning, I'm going to talk to you um, in two, two parts. So today you get part one. In August, you'll get part two. Um, 
It, it's been something that's been burning in my heart for a while now and just feel this is the right time to bring it. And I find it very interesting listening um, as we were worshipping this morning and hearing what God was saying to different people. And um, it's nice when you get confirmation that what you're going to say is right on the ball. Um, because I'm going to talk to you about we've always done it this way. Now what was that we heard about keys, old keys, new keys? I want you to keep that in your mind and in your thinking as we begin to look at the subject that I've chosen this morning. I'm going to read to you, as we start this, from Numbers 21. Now you can follow me if you like, but I am reading from the message version. Okay. 21 verse 4, they sent out from Mount Hor along the Red Sea Road a, det a detour around the land of Edom. The people became irritable and cross as they travelled. They spoke out against God and Moses, why did you drag us out of Egypt to die in this God-forsaken country? No decent food, no water, we can't stomach this stuff any longer. So God sent poisonous snakes among the people, they bit them, and many in Israel died. People came to Moses and said, we've sinned. When we spoke out against God and you, pray to God, ask him to take these snakes away from us. Moses prayed for the people. God said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a flagpole. Whoever's bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a snake, a fiery copper, and he put it on top of a plague pole, and anyone who was bitten by the snake looked at it and lived. I think the first slide you're about to look at, the complainers. We don't complain, do we? I, I don't know if you're a bit like me, but I, I, many times I've looked and followed the history of Israel, the Israelites, and I, you know, I'm just being honest here, and I thought, what an ungrateful bunch they were. Gee whiz, God is performing miracles left, right, and center, and as soon as it's not going quite according to plan, there's people whinging among them. We're not like that, are we? They had a tough route they had to follow. They said that the provisions were not good enough. And on top of all that, the leadership were failing. And that was a reference to Moses and God himself. They're not like us, are they? We don't like to whinge and moan, do we? I sat down to watch the England game the other night and um, I, I went into football mode. Those of you who like football know what that means. And about five minutes in, my wife said to me, are you going to say anything positive? <laughs> and I thought about it for a moment and I thought, Mm. And I suddenly realised how incredibly negative I was when I was watching the game. I was moaning about the ref, which is a normal thing I do anyway. I was moaning about the team selection. I was moaning when the ball wasn't crossed and it should have been. Because I'm an expert, of course. Not. And I suddenly realised, God, there I am preparing this message, good year, you are a complainer. Boy, I was complaining. Of course, the final whistle I wasn't complaining because England had won a game, which was exciting. It's very easy, and, and I think we all have very short memories, sometimes to forget how God good, 
how good God is to us. And the things he's done for us, they sometimes slip into the background and we suddenly realise actually, why, why hasn't God done this? Is, is anyone with me in this? It, it, it's just where we get sometimes. And the children of Israel decided they were going to have a major whinge and moan because, let, let's be honest, when they were in Egypt, friends, they had a pretty good healthy diet. They had fruit, they had meat, they had other things that they were not having when they were walking around in the wilderness. Now, of course, we know that part of the problem was they were walking around in the wilderness because it was their own fault. But, but you'd sort of have a little bit of sympathy because they remembered how good the food was in Egypt. Now, God was providing for them what they needed. Maybe not what they wanted. When I look at my bank balance and I think, oh, God, I'd, really, I could do with a new car, Lord. You know, that Ferrari 308, it's just, I you know, I could really do with that. And God says, man, you've got a car. Get you from A to B. And it actually has got a nice sunroof, so. But you understand what I'm saying? God makes provisions for us, and, he, and sometimes he gives us what we would like, but sometimes it's just what we need to get through. I think if we whinge and moan, and uh, it, it takes us along a very negative path, and, and there are consequences for it, friends. There are consequences. And in this case, it says that snakes came and bit the people. Now, I possibly think, and it's just my own, I think the snakes were always there because it would have been in the wilderness. There would have been snakes around. And I, I think that probably God, what happened was God withdrew his protection. That's what I think. I can't actually prove that, but that's what I think. Because I think those snakes would have been around and about anyway. But suddenly, whatever reason, the people start getting bitten by a snake. And there wasn't any NHS drop-off points in the wilderness. Uh, and people, because of that, started dying. You get bitten by a venomous snake, you can have a problem. We had someone a couple of months ago came in. I took him to a ward. His leg was huge. I asked him what happened. He got bitten by an adder. It's the only poisonous snake we have in this country. But it's quite serious. Quite serious That in natural habitat. I know we have other snakes around that are obviously kept under lock and key. I think it's interesting that as soon as these things started happening, the children of Israel, they realised they'd sinned. They realised that they'd done wrong. And in this day and age, friends, I think that's an interesting point because we can get caught up in the blame culture where there's always somebody else to blame. You remember when God came to Adam, he said, listen, it was a woman. And then what happened? The woman blamed the serpent. So ever, ever since then, people have been blaming each other for, for the fact that they're not prepared to take responsibility for their own actions. So they come to Moses and they say, listen, we've messed up here. We... <laughs> We spoke against you and we spoke against God and, and what do we do? And it says that Moses prayed for the people and God answered. 
Moses was acting as a mediator. You and I have a mediator. His name is Jesus Christ. So we don't have to go to John Petz every week and say, can you pray for me because I've messed up this week. If I mess up, I can say, God, I've messed up. And because I can come through Jesus, we can sort it out. That is fantastic. That is just amazing. There is one mediator, it says in T Timothy, the man Christ Jesus. But when we say we're going to pray for someone, how easy does it roll off the tongue? I was talking to a chap in work this week. He was, he's having one or two problems, domestic level. So I said, listen, Thursdays I pray for the guys at work. He looked at me and said, really? And I said, yes, I do. Thursday's my day when I, anyone who I come into contact with at work, I pray for them. I think it freaked him out a little bit. Um, but I'll pray for you easy to say isn't it and, and some of us we pray but what does it actually mean when we say we're going to pray for someone I'll tell you what it means friends it means that you and I have the ability to tap in to the resources of the one and only mighty God who is capable of changing a situation, changing a circumstance, healing, delivering, doing wonderful things. You know, anyone with me? God. So when you say, listen, I'm going to pray for someone. Yes, I am going to tap into the power of Jesus. I'm going to see you come through this situation and this difficulty. Prayer, friends, is a powerful, powerful weapon that we possess. And I'm not always sure that how much we appreciate it. So, Moses gets a plan of action from God. And what was the plan of action? I find this quite interesting because they'd already made a golden calf... Have you ever thought about this? I, I just find it quite interesting. Um, but they decide, uh, God says to Moses, right, stick a serpent up on a flagpole, and if they look at it, they can live. So, interestingly, there's an element of faith still needed, because they still need to look at it and live, but there is the remedy, if you like, there is the way out for these people who have been bitten in John 3 which is obviously a really really well known chapter in the Bible we all know verse 16 probably for God so loved the world what you might not remember quite so easy is in 14 and 15 it actually talks about as the as the serpent was raised up in the desert, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. So Jesus speaking about himself and about the fact that he was going to die on a cross. And so Moses erects this bronze serpent on a flagpole and the children of Israel look and live. Wonderful. Now I've heard two, three, four sermons probably in my lifetime about this passage of scripture and it's been used in the gospel context and there's nothing wrong with that. But that isn't what I primarily want to say to us this morning. If you don't know Jesus, you can look to him and you can live. Because sin bites. 
Sin causes poison to go round your system. And the only remedy, the only remedy is to look at the cross and look to Jesus and he will heal you. But now I want to fast forward a little bit in history and talk about one of the kings of Judah whose name was Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah was pretty good, actually. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. If you read through some of the books of Kings, and uh, he talks to you about who did wrong and who did right. Hezekiah basically did what was right. He was a good fellow. He says he followed in David's footsteps. Not a bad model to follow in, is it? And it says that Hezekiah destroyed all the false images, gods and idols that had been set up that the children of Israel were worshipping. So they were all destroyed. Interestingly, and you'll hear me say this name a number of times in my two sermons today and next time, one of them was called Nehushtan. Now Nehushtan simply means the old serpent, basically translated. But what is really, really interesting here is it's the very same serpent on the flagpole that was used in the story and the account that we read. So the children of Israel had begun worshipping this bronze serpent and they'd been sacrificing idols to it. They were worshipping something that they were worshipping a creature, if you like, rather than the creator. They were worshipping the method rather than the architect. Yeah? Now, I need you to bear with me because uh, where we go from here in this, in this talk this morning, it's going to stir a few things up. And you may not like one or two things that I'm going to say, but I'm asking you to bear with me. But I want to stir you up in, in, a, in a, a funny sort of way. Friends, we're not called to worship methods. Now, sometimes a method may work. And in this case when Moses was instructed by God at that specific time for that specific moment the serpent was raised and people looked and lived but what history proved here is they, they started worshipping it because hey this is the focal point this is how God did it before and this is how God's going to move in the future rubbish friends Absolute garbage. I serve a God who is creative. And that means that methods, God changes. The story is told of a little girl who's watching her mother put a joint of meat into the oven. And she cuts off the end of the joint of meat. And the little girl says to her, Why have you done that, mummy? And she says, Well, grandma, grandma's always done it. All oh, right, okay. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll ask grandma. So she goes to grandma and says, Grandma, 
Why did you cut the end off the joint of meat? Does it make it taste better? Does it look good? No, no, she says. Didn't fit in the oven. <laughs> Oi, we can laugh, friends, but things get passed on and we don't know why they're passed on. They may have been the reason for them initially. They may have been, uh, you know, if you like, a focal point at some point. I've said here, methods can become biblical principles in some people's mind that do not exist. It's okay once, but not now. So, we're going to look at four subjects that I have compared what the Bible says. Okay, so we're going to get what the biblical principles are, hopefully. And I've listed under what Nehushtan, what can be methods that we won't deviate from. I've said this before, and, and I'm speaking to myself. We are creatures of habit, are we not? If I was to take a picture of this congregation right now, and then come back in four weeks' time, you know where I'm going, some of you, and take another picture, oh my word, nobody's moved. They've been there for four weeks. Good grief. I don't know if anybody's noticed. It's, I suppose because I've been working on this, I have subtly been moving myself around in the church. So I've been sitting in different positions. I've been doing it deliberately. I'm a rebel. There you go. I mean, your chair has your name on it, does it? Now, don't get me wrong. I know sometimes there are practical reasons why some people sit. You know, they might sit near the toilet door or they may need to sit near the back in case one of the children kicks off or whatever. So I understand those things. But do you understand what I'm saying when I say we're creatures of habit? Because we are. We tend to come in and sit in the same place. And by golly, there's the same person sitting next to us again. Just happens to be the wife or husband, never mind. Well, so as I've laid this foundation, are you with me? Do you understand where I'm coming from? I want to talk about biblical principles in these areas we're going to look at. But I also want to, if you like, smash down the Houston. Which, which says that it's got to be done this way. And I want us to think about what we've heard through the Spirit this morning about the keys. The old keys and the new keys. And I, actually I'm going to say something. I, I'm not necessarily thinking it's for one person. I think it might be for the church, friends. Bearing in mind what I'm speaking on here. So we may have to look at methods. We may have to look at the way we do things. But let's not elevate methods to biblical principles. Four areas I want to cover in the next two sermons. I've laid you the, the foundation. and We're going to look at one of them today. And then the other three we'll look at next time. But for your interest, I'm going to tell you that the first one we're going to look at is praise and worship. Second one's evangelism. Third one is divine healing. And the fourth one is church life. Praise and worship. I, we've come in here this morning. I thought it was a lovely atmosphere. Praise and worship. God was talking to his people. We were lifting up the name of Jesus. I thought the young people did marvellously well. When we 
dedicate our talents to the Lord, he can use us. No matter what our personality, you know, God uses us, doesn't he? So what does the Bible say about praise and worship? <laughs> Number one tells us that we can lift up hands. So if you think it's weird being in church seeing someone lifting their hands, actually it's a biblical principle that we lift up our hands. Psalm 63, 4 talks about it. And it's mentioned in other places. Now you've got to bear with me on this because there's so many scriptures that I could pummel at you, but I just wanted to give you a flavour if you like. Secondly, Psalm 47, 1 talks about clapping our hands. Talks about getting a rhythm going. The third one I've said here is mentioned in Psalm, certainly in Psalm 150, it talks about the use of musical instruments. And I just love it. We all have different flavours, don't we? We all like different instruments. Um, I mean, I absolutely love Steve playing the saxophone. I just love it. I really enjoy saxophone music. But there are many different instruments that we can appreciate and listen to and enjoy. It's mentioned all through the Psalms, the use of music and instruments. Number four. Dancing. Now, I keep being reminded by people at work I've got new hips, which I have. Dancing's mentioned in Psalm 149 and 150, and most of us perhaps know the story of David when the ark was coming back and, and he danced before the Lord with all his might. Wonderful to express your excitement before God. Is that not right? Some of you are not setting yourselves up, are you? Because you know where I'm going. <laughs> Psalm 149 also talks, number five, about new songs. I, I must be getting old. I except this but we have so many new songs these days it's hard to keep track isn't it but it's great because new songs it talks about singing with new songs to the Lord so that's scriptural nothing wrong with that and then of course I've put a sixth point here that Psalm 100 talks about us entering into his gates with thanksgiving, entering into his courts with praise. So it's a general psalm that encourages us to prepare ourselves to come in to lift up the name that is above every name. Hallelujah. Now we're going to look at Nehushtan. What's the first one I've written down? Oh. Now, be very careful here, and I am not knocking Wesley hymns. Okay? You need to hear that because there are some fantastic hymns. And there are some hymns that we should keep singing, in my opinion. Okay? But, friends, we don't elevate them to a biblical principle. Because they are not. They are a style. They are a style of, of song. They are a style that at one time was very popular and was 
people sung and worshipped God through them. And I'm not saying that now we can't use them either. We can. But if we start elevating them to a biblical principle, friends, we need to destroy Nehushtan. I'm going to balance that now with number two, hill songs. Now, once again, I have got absolutely nothing against hill songs. I think they've what they have produced, some of the stuff that's come from their organisation, and and some of the people who are involved in it are God-given people who have a talent. And they have written new songs and they have produced wonderful ways of worshipping God. But if you say to me, well, we can't have a good time of praise and worship unless we get a Hillsong song, forget it, friends. Come on. We're not worshipping Hillsongs. We thank God for their talent. We thank God for their songs, and I enjoy some of them as well. But we don't elevate them to a biblical place that doesn't exist. The third thing is, E! Dancing. So we went through what? The old Pentecostal pogo. Who remembers that? So I'm just demonstrating that my hips are working, okay? Oh, there. There is the charismatic sway. Any of you, you know, been involved in the charismatic sway? Wonderful. Oh, there's the... Um, Jumping up and down on the spot. Can't do anything else, so I'll do this. I'm not knocking any particular dance style, friends. I'm not knocking it. But if we say, well, we're in a Pentecostal church, so we've got to do the old pogo or the two-step, then forget it. What is important is what's in my heart and it, and it comes, it may come out in a certain way. I'll tell you something that really blew my mind. I was in a prayer meeting um, somewhere up north and there was such, a, as we prayed, we had a real breakthrough and it, it was tremendous and people were worshipping God and suddenly we were singing and we were dancing around this place like there was no tomorrow. I mean, talk about country dancing, all swinging around arms and legs. I mean, it was incredible. Now, what the key thing for me was, nobody was looking at each other. Nobody was looking at me because they'd have got a shock. <laughs> um, but what people were doing was expressing their joy and excitement before God. So don't limit your thinking into thinking, oh, it's got to be. Do you, do you understand where I'm coming from? I've put a final one there of number four. Styles of music change constantly. That's true. And you've got to listen to the music scene. And, and styles are changing all the time. Different styles that we we are subjected to. Some we like, and some we don't. It's true, isn't it? See, I believe, friends, we we all have unique personalities, and through them, we're called to worship and praise God. What is biblical is that we are called to worship and praise the Lord. I'm going to finish by telling you a story. About my mum. 
Now I know I've not mentioned my mum very much. Some of you know things because I've told you things. My mum, bless her, is her mobility is not very good these days. She's as sharp as a button in her mind, but her mobility's not great. But I remember years ago we had a discussion about praise and worship, and I remember mum saying we we're in a group, and mum said. Well, of course, I'm quite shy, which is true. My mum is quite shy. And um, she said, I, I'm not into all this over-exuberance and excitement. I remember her mum saying it. And I, I thought, OK, I'll let it go. And... Not too long after that, my brother, myself and my mum went up to watch Arsenal play. Uh, what was then Highbury, because they've moved since then. So we're going to a football match. And there's, I don't know, 50,000 people in this cacophony, I can't even say that right, this huge load of noise and atmosphere in the place, it was, it was fantastic. Now, do you think, friends, that my mum was sitting in her chair, watching the game and every now and again a little clap? Marvellous. No, she wasn't. I, in fact, I remember clearly one point where the referee... Uh, missed a clear penalty, right? I mean, I've got my Arsenal hat on, and uh, but there was a clear penalty in front of us, and people were up in arms, uh, really furious that the ref had missed this decision. And I'll never forget to the day I die, my mum standing up, uh, quite big lady. I mean, she's what five foot ten, so she's not any small person. Stood up took her glasses off and shouted at the top of her voice, offering the referee her glasses. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Loved it. And I said to her, not that long afterwards, I said, uh, funny that, Mum. Funny that, that you... Got so excited. Oh no, she said, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> she said, I don't need you to tell me. Oh, fair enough, Mum, not saying anything. And and after that, my mum had a completely different attitude. We have something to be excited about. And I, on this note, I finished this morning, we have something to be excited about. Friends, David got excited. And he said, I don't care how excited I get, because I'm dancing before the Lord. And friends, David did not know Jesus like you and I know him. Did he not? He didn't. So in a sense, if you want to use the phrase, we're a little bit up on David. As I said, next time we'll look at evangelism, we'll look at divine healing, and we will look at church life. But I want you to come with an open mind, and I want you to think, and, and I want you to challenge your thinking and, and think through these things about the fact we are creative and we're created to come up with methods and ways of reaching people, of worshipping God, of doing different things so that we can see the body of Christ grow and develop. Yeah? Amen. Thank you. With words of wisdom, encouragement, and just be open uh, to the Lord speaking through you, just as you have tea and coffee together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have heard. And for some of us, um, we're pleased to hear the challenge. And some of us, perhaps, um, 
and that as part two comes through as well, we'll start to feel um, even more challenged. But I just ask Holy Spirit that you would move on our hearts, move also on our minds, help us to think the way you want us to think. We are aware, Lord, that your ways are higher than our ways, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts and we want to be in tune with you we want to keep in step with the holy spirit so help us to do that in jesus name i pray for everyone gathered here that you would give them all a fantastic week ahead in jesus name amen amen have a great time